what makes a really good CEO of a company? And my answer very simply is that you hire the best people to do the jobs that are needed, and then you're wise enough to back off and let them do it. You identify the role, what's needed. What does your business need to get a full picture and provide the services for itself and for its customers? And then you hire people to do that based on the qualifications. Those qualifications will either be proven in those roles or be proven to be something totally different. I always look at a job role as really just the starting point and then let that person find out, can they be successful? Can they be joyful? Can they be productive? Can they feel fulfilled? filled in that role. If not, let them have the opportunity to look at everything else the company needs. Can they help other people? Can they help people without needing to take a lot of credit themselves, but doing it because it benefits the overall good of the company, of the environment, of the culture, and just makes everybody happy. Welcome back to the Honest Marketing Podcast, where you learn proven strategies to grow your business without selling your soul. I'm your host, Travis Albritton, and today's episode is a absolute masterclass in building a healthy, sustainable business with proven principles that you can take and apply to any industry. And my guest, Paul Barron, is a serial entrepreneur who has started and exited more than a dozen businesses and currently serves as the CEO of thewallprinter.com, which is the sole distributor of a particular wall printing technology in the Western Hemisphere thinking Canada, United States, Mexico, Central South America, and really has a great business model, but also has some really great strategies that you can implement, both if you're thinking about social media and using that as client acquisition. We talk about LTV and calculating how much you can spend to acquire customers. We talk about building a team, identifying a niche, communicating problems and solutions for people. And so it was just a really great opportunity to say all the things that we talk about on this podcast and consolidate them around one particular kind of business, in this instance, selling machinery to businesses to make money. But regardless of whether you have a company that's like that or not, this episode will really give you some great things to think about and to implement in your business. Now, be sure to stick around to the very end of this episode where I'll be giving my number one takeaway from my conversation with Paul, but here it is, let's dive in. So right now, your current business, you've had quite a few of them, but your current business is the wall printer. Walk me through when you first kind of discovered this technology abroad, the things that you were thinking about and considering as far as bringing it to this side of the, the world, North and South America, and where the opportunity could be and kind of gauging you know, how confident you'd be it'd be a successful venture to start this particular business with this particular technology question, Travis, um, I would probably have to preface it by giving a little bit of background as to uh, the reason I got here and the reason I identified this particular product. Um, it wasn't something that I was ever looking for. Um, it wasn't something I knew about. Uh, but based on my history um, and the path that I've taken over the all too many years, as I point out these days because I'm 70 years old. So my 50 year journey since college into the workforce and into what's led me to my current venture, the wall printer, um, has had a, um, was predicated on my understanding the hats I like to wear and the hats I don't like to wear. Um, the kind of uh, success that I've achieved, I believe for the most part, was in building, establishing, identifying positive relationships. Uh, whether that be with customers, vendors, partners, investors, um, friends, family, um, trying to understand people's needs, trying to understand um, what drives them, um, which in turn helped me focus on perhaps the path that I wanted to take, whether that be emotional, social, or career business. Um, and so uh, over the years, I developed a kind of and again, without getting into the total background of it, depending on how much time we have, but about 20, 30 years ago, um, I was a, a communications consultant. And that followed the exit of a software company that I had founded, uh, which was a developed a small communications software solution uh, for, the, for marketing and telemarketing. And it was basically something that prevented people who didn't want to be called from being called. It is now a federal law, but I had the first software application that actually prevented people from being called by telemarketers when they said, don't call me anymore. <laughs> now it's called the national don't call me list. And so from somebody who was 
very annoyed by people always soliciting uh, my business un, um, unrequested um, and just cold called. Um, I founded this company that developed a product and then sold that to um, not only businesses who are in the telemarketing business, but those companies who manufacture telephone equipment. Um, it was distributed by AT&T and some other big telephone manufacturers at the time, and it was a business I exited. But in the process of that, I became somewhat of a communications consultant, and I got hired by a company who wanted me to take their communications product, which was a, a board that went inside other devices, and, <clears throat> and they were going into the sales cycle, and they wanted somebody to identify the customers for their product. And so I did that for about a year, two years, um, but one of my competitors was a Russian company, uh, we went around to the same trade shows, industry events. We always vied for the same business with the same customers. And invariably, even though their technology happened to be far superior and much more um, uh, a, a wider scope of solutions that they offered than the company I was representing, invariably I won business where they did. And we would go out, and as I guess the expression is, as frenemies, at the end of the day, we'd sit down, we'd have a couple of vodkas, and those boys can drink. Um, so we, we went out, um, and we'd have drinks, and invariably the conversation came, hey, congratulations, Paul, I understand you just landed that account with Motorola. And I said, yeah, you know, and they, and they would say, well, we really can't understand it. You know our solution is so much better than yours. And I said, yes, and now this is no disrespect to anybody, Travis, on your audience that has German heritage. I still trade after 12 years working for them. I still trade business uh, Christmas cards and birthday cards with the ownership and other employees. But my answer to them was the reason I got that business and you did not was because you're Russian, I'm not. And and the reason that that statement, I'm saying that so, you know, uh, matter of factly, was because like with anybody, it's cultural and personal. Uh, especially in the sales process. People very rarely buy anything but the person. Most people don't understand that, that there are many choices people have and why they buy a car from you or they go out to a particular restaurant. So everybody has their reasons for doing business with somebody. But culturally, uh, the American companies in the tech sector preferred to do business with an American who, who they felt understood their needs more or could just communicate it a little bit easier to make the whole process go smoother and more quickly. And so uh, that was the basic differentiator between us. It certainly was not the technology. Theirs was, in fact, better. And then two years down the road, the fact that I mentioned earlier that they had a much wider range of solutions than the company I was representing really fascinated me and, and got my passion going because this was the start of my journey representing a foreign company. They made me the proverbial offer I couldn't refuse, and I went to work for them. And it's a relationship that started in about the year 2001, 2002, went for about 12 years. And, uh, and I was licensing um, their audio, video, communication, navigation system uh, technologies to U.S. manufacturers of devices. And it was a very successful, very rewarding relationship. Um, and then China was coming up on the world stage in communications technology, which was basically geographically in Moscow's backyard. So I had done pretty much all I could do with the company. And so I left them and we just remained friends to this day. But um, there was no more business for me to really do for them. Um, they were now on their own, so to speak. And, uh, and people were accepting their technology from the work that I had done. And they didn't really need me that much. And so with that said, I moved on and I became this kind of consultant to now foreign companies who could find and identify and nurture their American audiences. So taking you through a little bit shorter than that background, which was the foundation, I then launched a, um, a very innovative baby bottle for an Austrian manufacturer in the United States, a Chinese headband headphone for children, um, another media communications board for an Israeli company, um, a self-service dog wash system from Australia, um, and, and all along the way, I was doing this as a hired gun, just like with the Russian company that I represented. I was a commission salesperson when I say hired gun. Um, I worked on commission. Um, I was very confident in my capability to do sales. I did very well for myself and my family um, and people that worked for me along the way in, in supporting my, my independent businesses doing this uh, consulting type of work and sales and marketing. Uh, but uh, but I didn't really own anything. And prior to everything I just said, 
I did own several of my own small businesses in various areas. Right out of college, I started a sporting goods shop, um, primarily in the tennis sector, a specialty sporting goods shop, which grew to three stores. Uh, then I went into the restaurant business. I had a very successful restaurant for 12 years in New York. Um, a couple of other ventures that I did along the way uh, that I owned. And I kind of missed that control and that ownership. But I knew what hats I liked to wear and which ones I didn't like to wear. And it was that sales and relationship building that I really enjoyed in all of these ventures. And so I stopped basically being that hired gun and commissioned salesperson. And, and I, but I was always searching for something, um, some product or service um, that was innovative, that was interesting, something I could get passionate about, and something that I saw as um, a solution to a problem which nobody should enter a business whether it be with a software development or an idea or just because, you know, they think they've got a better hamburger um, or a better plumbing supply store or something or pest control. You know, there's no reason to get into a business just because somebody else is doing it uh, unless you really can do it better, differently, and bring something to the table that that fills a gap in the marketplace. And, and then you can communicate that gap and the value proposition that you have and actually do business for everybody's benefit. Um, so I, I was idly surfing the net, as I often do, and invariably I, um, uh, something comes across my desk. Once again, a German company, and this is now no disrespect to anybody in your office with German heritage. Um, I drive a BMW. I value a well-engineered product, but something I cook with Henkel knives, which I think are the best in the world. But um, I don't uh, think that he, somebody should pay twice something just because it says made in Germany or made in Israel, or made in New Jersey. Um, just the fact that it's made someplace, depending on how it's made, and what its quality and value is, that should determine what somebody pays for something. Um, and so a German company approached me with a vertical printing machine, and they wanted to bring it across the pond, so to speak, um, to North America, and they wanted somebody to market it in the United States. And they had actually already identified somebody in Canada, and they want, collectively, they wanted somebody in the United States to reach into this audience, and they asked me if I would represent them. Um, I found the product fascinating, had never seen it before. Many people would argue this next statement. I think of myself as fairly normal um, in terms of um, products, at least, um, and being an American consumer of sorts. If I can afford something and I see that it has value to me um, or to my family, um, I, I may purchase it. Um, but it's rare that I see something that's totally new, uh, totally innovative that I haven't seen uh, before as, uh, as far as a product goes. And so when this German company approached me with their vertical printing machine, but we could not make the deal I wanted to represent them because once again, they wanted me to be a commission salesperson. I decided I'm not going to do that anymore. Um, I tried to take an equity stake in the business, but they would not be open to that. Um, and so if I couldn't own it, I wasn't interested. So we stopped our communications with one another, but basically I really love the product and I like the concept. Um, their product was about a $50,000 project, a $50,000 product, and it went up from there with various features and things like that. It seemed very expensive to me, but I had no idea what I was talking about. And of course I had never seen this before. Um, but I called to my wife and I started looking at these vertical printing machines and I said, Maureen, come on over here, take a look at this in my home office. And invariably, rather than listening to me and coming to see what I'm talking about, she cuts up the credit cards and hides my bank account from me <laughs> because she thinks, oh, here we go again. Paul's going to invest in something crazy. Um, this time she did come take a look and she saw it and she said, that's really cool. Why don't you learn more about it? Which is what I did. Um, and I found out there were, that there were only five manufacturers of this type of machine in the world, none of them in the United States or even North or South America. Uh, they were confined to Southeast Asia where the technology originated. There was a company in Australia. There was a company in uh, India. Uh, there was the German company that approached me first. And there were two Chinese companies. One the originator, one a copy of the first. Chinese don't only copy us, they copy themselves when they see something that's pretty good. And so, um, but I whittled them, I, I did my due diligence as, you, as it's known, um, you know, kicking the tires of all these companies, trying to understand what the differences were. And I settled on the originator of the technology, which had been around for about 15 years 
and they developed the technology. They had a product that was much more feature rich, um, had patents that were interesting to me, um, and also opportunities that were interesting to me. And we, we began the courtship to see if there was some way that we could move forward. And in fact, fast forward a year in 2019, um, we created an agreement between us where I took that product on um, as an owner in the company and, and became uh, the sole distributor for all of North, South, Central America, Mexico, the Caribbean, and everything basically in the Western Hemisphere that they weren't marketing to. And, and that became my company. And, uh, and today we've actually developed beyond a wall printer, a floor printer, which prints logos and graphics and everything on the floor. The wall printer, which was the original technology. Um, if we have video in this call for your audience, uh, the picture in my office here that's on cinder blocks. My warehouse is a cinder block building. And so that's a concrete wall that is primered white, but that, that's a wall painting um, because my office staff wasn't nice enough to give me a window in my office. So I had to go ahead and wall paint one with one of our machines. Um, but it's a machine that does print graphics, high quality, near photo quality graphics, any surface, indoors, outdoors, whether it be brick, paper, canvas, um, or walls of uh, metal, wood, tile, uh, doesn't make any difference. Doesn't even have to be a smooth wall. This wall is not smooth, it's rough concrete. It just has to be a flat wall um, and we can print on it. We can print on garage doors. We can print on anything that doesn't have obstacles that the machine can just go across. But it was a fascinating product to me and I decided to investigate and determine, is this something that people want? That's the first thing. Uh, you don't start a business, you don't create a product, you don't develop software unless you're actually doing something that's a solution to a problem. Um, you can't go chasing a problem by creating one just to find a solution or to create a solution. And so I'm not an artist. I know nothing about printing machines. I didn't, I know, I knew less then, but I don't know much more now. Um, and, uh, but it was a fascinating machine that uh, again, as I mentioned repeatedly, I've never seen or heard about before. And so, um, I decided to, to invest in this and bring them here to the United States in 2020. Wasn't the smartest kid on the block because the world stopped in January of 2020 after I invested a considerable amount of money in bringing these machines here and parts and support. Um, started manufacturing my own inks here um, in the United States. I've got two factories in Kansas and Florida that manufacture inks for us because a printing machine needs to have the right ink, otherwise it won't work. Uh, learned that the hard way. Um, and, uh, and, but it was 2020, January, when I first had my machines on hand. And it was a time when nobody was traveling anywhere. People were being laid off. Uh, people were working remotely. Uh, and, uh, as a result of COVID and I decided, well, I'm all in on this financially. So now let's find out who wants it and let's figure out how these machines work. So I started building a team, uh, both on the technical side and then on the marketing side. And I decided to do some honest marketing of my own and, uh, and using social media primarily with Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, um, Reddit, um, Instagram, Pinterest, um, and building a website and using SEO to uh, attract people with Google AdWords and things like that, that are the tools of the trade for social uh, media marketing. Um, we decided to find out who wants this by introducing it with videos, and images of what this product would do. Um, not really talking about the business opportunity that it presented to people, but that was our goal, was to try to identify people who might be fascinated by the technology to the point of wanting to learn more about it. And then some subset of those people would be people who might be interested in taking this on as a business and learning what that's about, and what that might cost. And so that's where we ended up. It, it took us 10 months before we made our first sale in 2020. Fast forward now to 2023, we're selling about one to two new territories a week. We're not a franchise. We don't reach into our customers' pockets for their revenue, uh, but we do give them because if they're brave enough to be the first kid on the block, so to speak, to want to be a wall printer, we give them an exclusive territory where we won't sell machines to anybody else in that geographic. Um, and they take on the machine and the territory and build a business. And we've got about 117 as of today, um, customers that hopefully are doing well, building their own future, hopefully realizing their 
financial and business dreams or adding this on to their existing business. Maybe they're painters or general contractors, photographers, muralists, graphics designers, somebody in the trade, so to speak, that may look at this as a way to add revenue. And then half of our customers are people who are just startups, just using it for some business that they think is cool and uh, want, to, want to begin something on their own and to, uh, to achieve, put their stake in the sand, so to speak. So, okay, I'll take a breath and let you ask me questions. But that's, that's the background of how I got to where I am today. Well, I appreciate the journey you just took us on because it really does paint this picture. I think a lot of people from the outside looking in, they can look at trying to grow, build a business or grow a business. And it's either very uh, romanticized, like this idea of like you're on the ground floor of a startup and then there's tension and co-founders are throwing chairs at each other. And then something magical happens. You get a bunch of VC money and now you're a multimillionaire or just like the just the constant grind of like trying to make something happen and it's not working and then it is and it's not and back and forth. But you're seeing how it's evolved over time and and that you had enough insight to spot an opportunity when you came across it and following your own curiosity before deciding, okay, we're going to invest in this and then being able to come out of the other side of a pandemic, like literally starting the business right before <laughs> everything shut down. Uh, that's pretty remarkable because that was during a time when a lot of businesses were trying to hunker down and figure out how do we survive while we can't do business the way that we have. Uh, when you were... And I, cer I yeah. certainly don't want, I, and I certainly, sorry to interrupt, but I certainly don't want to um, mislead your audience um, or overstate the fact that that I didn't know what I didn't know at the time when this pandemic came a, a, around us. Um, but I was able to understand the fact that there were a lot of people rethinking their lives at the time. And there are a lot of people who were not only working remotely or laid off, but they had time to reevaluate their own lives. Do they want to continue to work in this sector? Do they want to continue to work for somebody? Is there a different path? Is there a better path? Is there something where maybe it's time for me to look at a business and take more control of my life? Um, I'm not to say that what I've done in my life is for everybody. God knows I've driven family and friends crazy with my journey and the ups and downs that it's had along the way. Um, on the other hand, I've been very lucky and supportive uh, and supported by a lot of people along that path as well um, who were un who were able to have as much confidence in me as I had in me and help me through some of those valleys back to the peaks. And uh, But this was a time that, uh, to your point, that could have been, uh, it could have gone a totally different direction. It could have been, you know, at a time when people just didn't, didn't really want to get out and, and do something else, but it turned out to be the opposite. It turned out that people were able to actually start looking for something um, in their own lives and on their own paths and journey. And, uh, you know, 117 customers may not seem a lot, like a lot, but for a business where you have to invest thirty to $50,000 um, to buy a machine of, of, a, of a type that you've never heard about and develop skills in terms of learning how to use these machines and then how to market it, because you're in Jacksonville, Travis. Uh, we have a Jacksonville um, owner. Um, of that, that area. And so what I said to them, which is what I'm going to repeat here in the course of a Zoom call like this, um, I know this isn't Zoom, but a, a video call, um, we go ahead and we, uh, this is how I usually engage people who are interested in learning more about this product. And, but invariably I will come up with this sentence um, at some point if they seem serious about it. I said, you know, being in the wall printing business, there's good news and bad news. And you can translate this into any business venture that somebody wants to be into. The good news is you're going to be the first one in Jacksonville to be a wall printer. The bad news is you're going to be the first one in Jacksonville to be a wall printer. So it's up to you to, to not only learn the technology, but to market it locally. And just like I learned how to market it to make people aware of this technology and of the business opportunity, it's up to the local customer, my customer, to make their customers locally aware that there's another way to put art on your walls. And if this is something that you might like to do, whether it's a picture of your dog that you want to have four foot by six foot in your family room, or you want to put the logo of a sports team, or you want to put a nice, beautiful um, seascape uh, mural on a wall, um, this is something you can do with our machines and find the customers who want that. So when you're walking through this with somebody and they're considering how the technology that you brought over here to the States can benefit either the business they already have or a business they want to start, 
how do you walk them through that to, to give them a vision of what's possible? Also knowing the best practices from the other clients that you worked with. And 117 in a B2B environment is plenty to have a really great lifestyle business. So uh, I think what you've done in the last three years is pretty remarkable uh, and really is a testament I, I to that. Your, your track record. Well, I appreciate that. It's more of a testament to the team I put together and the technology, which is reliable and it does what it says it does. Um, it is as advertised. Um, it works day in and day out. We just got finished. In fact, Louis Vuitton purchased one of our machines. Um, you know, I, I, I say that not necessarily to pat myself on the back. Um, it came, it started out with just an Instagram posting that somebody at Louis Vuitton in Paris saw, saw this and said, boy, that would be cool painting uh, pictures of some of our um, exhibits that they were going to have. Um, and in New York City, they had a three month exhibit. Um, and our machine was in the window on Madison Avenue, printing from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., seven days a week for three months, while Louis Vuitton did this um, three-month exhibition of creative um, artwork inside, um, they, they celebrating Louis Vuitton's 200th anniversary, um, is what it was. It was a worldwide tour. And when they got to New York, they selected our wool printer to print images in the window at the entryway to the exhibit. And, the, and, I, and I really say this because it proved the reliability of the machines. If the machines are used day in and day out and used properly, they can make somebody a lot of money printing murals uh, day in and day out. And so the challenge is, and, and, and to, to address your question, Travis, you know, trying to paint this picture to people of, of what opportunity there is out there. Well, there's no lacking walls. You know, every room's got them. Every building has them inside, outside. Um, you know, we also offer a floor printer. But as I tell people, unless you're in the flooring business already, you store installing floors that might be able to have some type of artwork um, embedded in that floor. Um, you know, look at the wall printer because there's four times as many walls as floors in any room. Uh, so the opportunities are much greater for wall printing than floor printing. Um, and there are very few choices. Um, you know, you could go ahead and take a poster and put it on the wall. Uh, you can frame a picture. You can uh, buy a vinyl sticker. Um, you could put wallpaper up. Um, but for artwork, there are very limited choices. And, uh, and, and this is a choice that uh, if you don't like it in a week or two years down the road, you primer over the wall and you start again. Um, so it's easy to replace these with another image when your taste change or your kids grow up. And today they might want the Disney character on the wall, but tomorrow they may be into the Olympics or college university logos or something. So there's no, there's no limit to what you can do with it. But yeah, painting that picture of the opportunity um, is something that comes out in these conversations. Um, and, and again, that's and, and I know I'm using, I, I'm not trying to sell the wall printer on anybody to your audience. I'm just, I'm just trying to talk about the, you know, painting the picture of a, of a business opportunity of why somebody makes a decision, whether to add something to a business, whether to start something fresh. Um, you know, it goes, you go through that thought process is who wants it? Can I do it? Um, can I hire somebody to do it? Um, I mean, our best customers are the ones who see this as a business where they may want to learn what it's all about. But they're going to hire people to do it because we, my business is selling and supporting the machines. So we want people to grow a business beyond just their one machine because it looks like a cool technology and okay, it's $30,000. Yeah, we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and invest in that because we may be able to make a couple of hundred grand or something in a year. But my thoughts for people are much greater than that. I want them to have three, four, five wall printing machines going in, in, in a community or in a city or in a county and providing business and job opportunities for other people. That's the real hope and dream of wall printing is that it's something new, something innovative, but unlike something that's been, not, not unlike, that's the wrong phrase. I mean, just like somebody who wants to be a plumber or an electrician or be in the pest control business or, you know, coffee shops or hamburger or pizza places. Um, you know, there's lots of them. But there's lots of them because people see them. They think it's an interesting business. They said, yeah, I could do that too. And, uh, and they do it. But nobody buys a McDonald's franchise. And again, we're not a franchise. Just using this as an example uh, for analogy purposes. Nobody goes into buying a McDonald's because they love hamburgers and French fries. They buy it because it's a business. It's a real estate investment. It's a way to, it's a way to grow value and investment for their home, their families, you know, their employees. Um, they're not doing it because they like cooking hamburgers. Um, and so we don't want people to buy a wall printer because they love getting their hands dirty with ink and they 
like you know printing, we want people to also get pleasure out of the results that our wall printers deliver, but at the same time understand this is a business. It's an opportunity to um, to support and grow wealth for yourself, for your family, for your employees. Well, and I think what you've uh, identified really well in those conversations, just you know, kind of reiterating what I'm picking up is you, you've done a, a good job, and, and some of this is just your natural tendency to be really good at relating to people and connecting with them and speaking to their problems, is clarifying the path to success and what that looks like. Because I know for a lot of times when you're interacting with a customer or a potential client, and they're like, okay, you do this, you do X, but I don't really understand how I can connect the dots to how your business is going to help me get to where I want to go. And, and you know, just through repetition, you'd be able to identify like, well, this is the path to how, you know, doing business with us and using our machine can add a capability or add it, spin up an entire new business. And this is how you can do it. And this is, these are the kind of results you can see if you follow this path. And, and we're a key piece in helping you get there. And so, like you said, it's, it's it, people don't buy the machine just because they think it's, it's a cool thing and they want to, you know, repaint one of their walls every once in a while, but they, they see it as a, as a piece in the path of where they want to go as a business person, as an entrepreneur, and seeing an opportunity that your technology presents to help them get there faster, more efficiently, or whatever the parameters are that they're looking for. And I think that's a principle that's so important just in business in general, right? Like if you can make the best thing ever, the best widget of all time, but if it's not meeting a specific need or communicating to a problem that someone's experiencing in a B2B sense, it's what's the problem you're overcoming for a company or how is this investment going to become profitable for them? You know, the, then you're just kind of shouting into the wind. And I feel like that's a problem that a lot of businesses have. That they, they don't know how to really identify clearly how their product or service is going to lead to success for the people they're trying to help. And th then that creates a lot of friction in the money conversation because they don't see a reason to give you money because they don't know what kind of problem you're going to solve for them. Absolutely, Travis. Uh, could could not agree more. Um, and people, everybody has to go through that due diligence process, not only um, determining whether or not this particular product will meet those needs, but when their customers are looking at this, you know, why should I do this rather than buy a vinyl sticker? Why should I do this rather than wallpaper or have somebody come in and hand paint, have the muralist to do this? You know, the muralist is a, is a great example of that with somebody who... Um, who is creative, artistic, has the skills to go ahead and paint a wall um, or to provide, you know, um, art in a restaurant or a museum or somebody's home or office space. Um, they have the capability of doing that. But, and, and initially the knee-jerk reaction to the wall printer when I introduced it and brought it here to the United States was I'm taking the food off the table of those creative arts and graphics designers, graphic artists. And nothing could be further from the truth because all we're trying to do is let them focus on the creativity that they have, but take the, take the process of applying that creativity to putting this image on the wall. This would take an artist a couple of days to do this. And they probably would not get the fine detail that you see in the mountains or in the seagulls. If you were in my office and could see the eyes on those seagulls, um, I don't think they're seagulls, but whatever <laughs> bird, bird they are, whatever kind um, of birds they are, yeah, whatever kind of bird they are. But but again, to get the kind of detail that you get from any kind of a picture um, that you put on your phone, you take with your phone, or you put on your computer, um, you know, you're not going to get that near photo quality uh, reproduction really from from most artists. Um, and an artist would spend two days doing this. This took two hours to print. Five feet by eight feet, 40 square feet, takes our printers about two hours to print that. And so, uh, you know, we want the artist to con continue to create art. And we want to let them, let the wall printer just put that art on a wall for them. Um, that's that's basically the, the connection and the mutual beneficial relationship that occurs between the creatives and the, the implementers of that creativity uh, as a work product. Um, that's, and, and we've had plenty of customers who want um, the artist to come in after the fact and further embellish it um, with some more creativity, fill in those spaces because the wall printer, unlike vinyl stickers or wallpaper, it has its limitations because of the machinery. It doesn't go edge to edge. It needs about 12 inches all around, top, bottom, left and right. If there are obstructions like walls or pipes or even light switches. Uh, which have to be removed from walls before you do a wall painting because our machine goes straight across the wall and it needs to have a relatively smooth surface. 
Uh, it doesn't have to be perfectly smooth. As I point out, this is concrete that's very rough behind me, but generally it won't go around something. Uh, it won't jump around a pipe or an obstruction, and it won't go more than less than 10 to 12 inches to the side wall or the ceiling or a floor. So sometimes an artist comes in and fills in all those gaps and does something a little bit more to it, if that's what the customer wants. You know, generally, this is what the customer wants, just some artwork on a wall. So take me back to when you first launched the business. You said when you launched it in January, it took you about 10 months to turn around your first your first acquisition, your first customer, your first client. Uh, whereas now you're doing, you know, one to two a week. What was that like, building momentum, gaining traction in that first 10 months? What ultimately led to that first sale? And then how have well, you kind of systemized that approach to grow, building awareness about your product to where so you now have like that scale? Was, mm -hmm. What it was like, I used to have dark hair. Um, that's what it was like. Um, so, so uh, no, I, I fully expected there to be a gap between introduction of the product and then customer acquisition. So it wasn't a surprise. COVID was a surprise for sure. Um, I didn't expect that. But again, because of the circumstance, not only on the customer side, people searching for things and me on the side, not being able to have people travel to look at it and us not being able to go, let's say, to a trade show or an industry event because they, they totally shut down and there weren't any. Um, so I had to come up with other things to do, which was basically learn the machine and put in all the things in place and the people in place to be able to survive until those customers started on board. We get 150 inquiries every single day here, Travis. Um, and again, I say that not in terms of boasting, but to answer your question, 150 inquiries come from our social media marketing, which is all we do. Um, we spend X amount of dollars on Facebook ads and Google AdWords and SEO for our website and Instagram and YouTube. And we spend money doing some of those things to be able to show videos, and let people understand that this is a business opportunity. But uh, out of 150 people that send us a, a little note or comment on, a, on an Instagram post um, or fill out a form on our website, uh, of those 150, 140 of them realize it's not a $100 Hewlett Packard desktop printer, um, but it's a $30,000 machine. And then they say, oh, that's not what I'm interested in. I didn't think it was going to be something like that. Um, and that's good because those people not only now can appreciate the value of a machine that produced that video or image, um, but they might know somebody um, that th maybe does want to look at this as a business that has the financial capability and capital and desire to invest in something, or they don't want to buy a machine, but they want to have a wall printed with some kind of artwork. And so we take all of those types of responses and we then put them into our database. And if we do have a wall printer like in Jacksonville and somebody inquires in Jacksonville, but they want a wall painted, we pass that on to them. But out of those 150, after you get rid of those 140 that want either a wall painted or just not interested in this type of an investment, um, then there are 10 people who say, okay, let me learn more. And the investment factor is not a barrier. Now it's a question of, is this the type of business they want to do? Do they want to invest in wall painting as opposed to pest control business or a, a hamburger place or a restaurant or something else or an accounting firm? You know, what, what is their background? What is their, what drives them not only from an emotional level, but then also learn, willing to learn more about if I'm going to invest thirty to $50,000, what's my return on investment? You know, I could use this money in any, we understand that people, if they do have the funds to invest, can invest it anywhere or just put it under a pillow, which sometimes is better these days than investing in a, in a bank or a CD. Um, but it, everybody has these choices. So it's up to us, again, to kind of directly answer your question, to articulate what the financial rewards can be if they do A, B, and C. Are they willing to understand that this is a commercial printing machine, unlike your desktop printer that does require daily maintenance. We always want to be upfront. And again, to use the title of your uh, program, you know, we want to be honest with people when we market this. Not only do you get a beautiful picture like this on the wall, but what does it take to get that picture? You know, do I get my hands dirty? Do I have to wear gloves? What, you know, what's, what can go wrong with the picture? What happens if something goes wrong with the picture? Um, all of these types of things. We like to set expectations honestly and appropriately, because there are some people who care about those things. There are other people 
who don't care at all. They'll just hire somebody to figure it out and to be the person to manage that printer and make it work properly um, with our support and guidance and training. Um, and then they'll go on and do the marketing end of things and helping people understand that here's a solution to put art. And it's no different than a signage shop that's out there, you know, doing signs and for local businesses. Um, you know, we can do that too on a piece of vinyl. We can print somebody's sign or, you know, something on a wall. We, but we don't do big physical plastic signs and backlit signs and those types of things. It's a place for everybody. Uh, we don't do vehicle wraps because we don't do curved surfaces. So there is a place for vinyl to do uh, a vehicle wrap on a car or a SUV or a truck for a business. We don't get into any of that stuff. Um, but again, trying to just set expectations honestly and appropriately and let people decide, is this the type of business that's interesting and doable? So leaning into the social media aspect and pay, you know, doing the organic, creating the content, making the videos and leveraging those platforms, but then also accelerating that with paid ads. Uh, I imagine you have in mind, like we're willing to spend X per, you know, qualified prospect. And you kind of have in your mind, like, this is our budget. This is how we know we're basically at the top end of what we want to spend. And you kind of have a profit margin baked into that. How much of, how much of that decision is, uh, you know, on the initial sale and how much do you factor in kind of the lifetime value of that customer with continued support and maintenance and supplying inks and those kind of things? Like how do you calculate what that lifetime value looks like when you're determining how much you want to spend to market to a future client? Well, first I get a dartboard. I put that on the wall um, and then I go ahead and I throw darts and I say, if some of them stick, <laughs> that's what we do. Uh, no, it, um, everything you've asked about um, are the right questions for any business. I mean, you have to have a product. You have to price that product. You know, why is my product $30,000? Why is this product from Germany $50,000? Is it just because they want to say it costs uh, $20,000 is worth putting made in Germany on it, um, but it's really a $30,000 product? Why are that? Why can you go to Alibaba on on you know Chinese marketplace and see a see a printer that looks like mine? I assure you, you and your audience that it's not mine, but they can see a product that looks like a vertical printing machine and it'll do what I say my machine will do, but yet it costs twelve or fifteen thousand dollars. You know what's the difference? You know so so you have to establish a price point, but that price point it has all the factors you've determined. Um, you know, I've got a staff of 15 people. I've got the support that we give to people from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m., seven days a week. Um, there's a cost associated with that. There's training. There's spare parts. When we deliver a printer to somebody, we kind of know what's going to break down within six months or something, um, you know, kind of like batteries or tires on a car, things that may go go and wear and tear. And then there are other products that are just simply covered under warranty. But the fact that we give a warranty, the fact that, uh, you know, we do give uh, parts replacement, that we give unlimited free technical support, all of these things have to be factored in uh, based on the expenses we have as a business to, to do that and deliver it into that initial cost we're getting. And to the great question and description you provided, Travis, um, to those ongoing costs. Will they buy another printer in two years or six months? Uh, will they buy more ink in two months or four months or six months? Um, are they getting the customers that they need to be able to buy more inks and to do more wall printings for customers? Um, if not, why not? Do they need assistance with marketing and some more guidance there? Um, which again, requires some additional resources on our part to help them and focus them in ways that will help them grow their businesses and their customer base locally. Um, so all of these things are factors as well as my costs of good. Um, and, uh, and and so, so we do factor in what our costs are for all of these things. Um, we determine what these costs are going, what continued maintenance and support is going to cost and the additional revenue we may get. And, and all of that hopefully um, is not a rapidly moving target, but pricing is always a moving target. Um, you know, we've been pretty fortunate and I, I have enough experience that, um, I kind of understand these expenses on our end. And so I was able to factor on, um, all that into costs that we made our first price increase of only $1,000 after three years. And most of that was because of shipping costs, um, that, that we incur, um, on a lot of our products. Um, but everything else has pretty much stayed the same for three years. 
um, from the original um, advertised cost that we've done. And so, but but yeah, you you have to you have to know these things. Um, you have to you have to understand. You know, I mean, it, it goes everything from buying product to paying your employees um, to providing ongoing support um, and everything else that goes along with it. And and knowing you know um, when when something is going to impact those costs. You know, do you have a product that uh, that is not reliable? You know, that's going to require more R and D, um, constant improvements. Uh, that's another whole area of research and development um, that some companies, you know, pay enormous amounts of dollars on. That has to be factored into their cost today to be able to get them to the point that they can deliver a reliable product to customers tomorrow. Um, you know, I, I've got a again a good product and a good relationship with an excellent factory um, that responds to a lot of these things. We've made improvements to the product in the three years I've been here, and uh, the factory has responded to it. And it hasn't greatly impacted costs where I've had to change our costs too much. But that's still an ongoing work in progress every day. We're always trying to improve the quality of the printing result. We're trying to increase or decrease the speed of printing um, to make it uh, something that people can do. The reliability of the machines. We want to lower the maintenance required on the machines. These are things that, while might they're not onerous, and people, our customers, when I say people, can make money with the machine just the way it is today, but we're always looking and listening to our customers to say, well, you know, why didn't you um, have success with a particular job? Or did it take too long to print it? Or did something happen where the colors didn't come out right? Um, all of these kinds of things are ongoing things that we need to do and then determine whether or not that's going to impact pricing, costs, or just re resetting customer expectations. You know, you, you can't come in here and you can you can see that this is a some type of a bird. Um, but if you were in my office and looking right at this picture, you would not be able to really make out very clearly the eyes or these hinges. I'm a little zoom challenged when I try to point behind me. Um, but these are these these hinges have six Phillips screws in them. But it's a little it's a little it's an inkjet printer the printing machine. So you can't really tell very clearly that they're Phillips screwdrivers, uh, Phillips screw heads, uh, but you can tell. But that's not what this is. This is not designed to be a photo quality reproduction. It's supposed to be wall art. Um, it's supposed to give the, the feeling of certain images and things. So the fact that it's not a crystal clear Phillips screw, that doesn't take anything away from it unless somebody, unless I'm selling this to a hardware store and they're trying to sell Phillips screws based on this picture, you know, then it would be a problem. Um, and again, knowing your customer and what they want to do. You know, you're putting a mural on the outside of a building where people just drive by it and they could see a nice scene of somebody surfing or mountain climbing or something. And they're not really looking to see that, you know, their sneakers aren't tied, um, something like that. And earlier you mentioned too that uh, you attribute a lot of your success to the team that you've been able to build and the people that you've been able to bring on and the roles that you fit them into. Uh, how do you identify... Uh, people that are not just going to be good skill-wise for what you need them to do, whether it's sales or customer support or things like that, but also a good culture fit for working cohesively as a team. Like what are the things that you're looking for intuitively as you're talking to people and kind of deciding is this person not only going to be able to contribute to the tasks they need to do, but also to help build the culture of a team that's going to work cohesively together? So a great question. The short answer, I have no idea, um, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I will tell you the benefit of something I learned very early on in my career. Uh, besides the fact that I learned what hats I like to wear and which ones I didn't like to wear, I love the sales and marketing, customer relations, engaging customers. I didn't like the administrative aspects of a business. I didn't like the record keeping. I didn't like the financial accounting. I did not like hiring, firing, and managing people. I was very independent. I was kind of a lone wolf in almost everything that I did. But when I owned a business, you have to fill all these different roles. Somebody asked me a long time ago, and people continue to ask me um, because they think I've done something good, um, and, and I appreciate that and feel very lucky more than anything else. Um, I guess if you just do enough, you know, hopefully you eliminate the bad and you try to capitalize on the good that comes from it. Um, but people ask me, you know, what's a good leader? What makes a really good CEO of a company? And my answer very simply is that you hire the best people to do the jobs that are needed, and then you're wise enough to back off and let them do it. Um, so 
my first answer to your question is you identify the role, what's needed. Um, is it support? Is it marketing? Is it social media? Is it video production? Is it sales? Is it somebody who is good with data and analytics? Um, you know, what does your business need to get a full picture and provide the services for itself and for its customers? And then you hire people to do that based on the qualifications. Um, those qualifications will either be proven or, um, or pr will either be proven in those roles or be proven to be something totally different. Um, you hope that, or at least I hope, that when I identify somebody um, to be part of this team, um, that they can fit a role. If it's because of their previous experience, that's a starting point and a starting point only. Once they have the tasks at hand and the responsibilities, now, it, now two things are going to happen. They're going to be very good at what they do or not. That's one thing, even though it sounds like two things, but to me that's one thing. Um, they're either good at what they do or not, and then they enjoy what they're doing or not. And so um, I always look at a job position or job role as really just the starting point and then let that person find out can they be successful can they be joyful can they be productive can they feel fulfilled in that role if not let them have the opportunity to look at everything else the company needs maybe i identify their skills because of an experience they had but maybe that's not what they wanted to do Maybe they just happened to get a job before this and they worked for 10 years doing something that they hated every single minute of the day, um, but that's what they were doing. And whether they were good or bad at it didn't make a difference if they weren't joyful at that. Um, so I really like giving people the opportunity to help everybody else. And now that brings out that whole cultural aspect that you mentioned. You know, do they fit in with other people? Can they help other people? Can they um, help people without needing to take a lot of credit themselves um, but doing it because it benefits the overall good of the company, of the environment, of the culture, um, and just makes everybody um, happy, uh, basically, um, and also satisfies the needs of the company and our customers. Um, I firmly believe in sharing the wealth. Um, there is Everybody who works for me gets a piece of the action. If the company succeeds, everybody succeeds. Um, and I'm not talking stock options, which... I've had before and are really as good as wallpaper sometimes, um, you know, but uh, and pretty pieces of paper um, that never really amount to anything. Um, but I'm talking about real dollars um, that, that are, that's a real reward for people's efforts um, when the customers are happy and people buy things and people are supported properly and everybody works together to make that happen. Because from the guy who starts that first Facebook ad and that video to make somebody aware of this to then the call or the inbound contact information form that gets filled to me or somebody else on my sales team um, talking to that person, qualifying them, to somebody coming in and visiting us and seeing the machines work, to somebody buying it and then needing to be trained and supported and then having problems and needing those problems fixed and addressed. Everybody works together in one way or another, even if it's at a separate point in that path. Um, and so finding people who can not only succeed in their specific role, I like to call it staying in your lane, uh, because sometimes people can see what somebody else is doing and maybe try to do too much of what somebody else is doing better or just their responsibilities. I mean, hey, look, I was in the restaurant business for 12 years. I learned how to wash dishes, tend bar, and cook, but that's not what I was in the business for. And believe me, I just because I can cook a hamburger doesn't mean that I should have been the one to do that. Um, I was better off doing something else and staying out of the way. Um, so, uh, again, you know, I hope that kind of answers your question in my typical long-winded way. Um, <laughs> but um, well, it does. It, it's, you're, uh, you're, you're identifying the right people and then helping them find the right seat on the bus to sit in, right? Even if that's different than how they yeah. entered the company. I, you know, I never mind if this is a stepping stone for somebody to go somewhere else in their journey and their career. I like starting with interns, with people in universities. I've got interns from local university here in Wilmington to uh, community college, um, to people uh, outside of this area who are doing um, some online work, remote work in, in social media aspects. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't mind if I could, if they could fill a role that we need, I could fill a role in their discovery of their own path. And it takes them whether to a full-time position here eventually because their support has helped us grow where I can afford to hire somebody else and I need to hire somebody else 
or it takes them in a, in a direction that says they're going to take a job somewhere else or they're going to go in a totally different direction because they couldn't stand doing what I had them doing. Um, and all of that is good as far as I'm concerned. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's just a question of putting people in positions and then, you know, letting them uh, find their path, finding their path here. And hopefully there's a benefit to everybody. I don't, I definitely don't begrudge anybody uh, from tell, walking in and saying, this is no longer for me. I would like to do this. Thank you very much for your contributions. Hope you had a good experience. Wish you the best of luck. Uh, the only thing I ever um, have um, fault with if somebody doesn't communicate and somebody's not honest and somebody's, um, you know, not totally upfront with what their expectations are and whether we're fulfilling them or not for them. If you open and you communicate with people, not only your team, but your customers and your employers, um, it should be a beneficial experience for everybody. Absolutely. Well, I really appreciate you sharing everything that you've shared. It's really been a great holistic case study, I think, for not just like the strategies of like how to market a business, but even positioning the product, thinking about pricing, thinking about you know, longevity and team building and all the aspects that come together to make a really healthy business. Uh, so I really just appreciate you sharing all those things. And, and the last thing I'll ask you is looking forward to the future, how do you think about continuing to to build on the things that have worked for you to this point, but also experimenting with new opportunities and in pursuing new strategies of whether it's growing the business or serving your clients better? How do you balance those things? And what are the kinds of opportunities that you're looking to take advantage of for 2023? Well, I'll, I'll answer this in a way that both, uh, both is honest and that my wife would tolerate me saying, <laughs> um, which is that for me, I'm, I'm 71 years old. I've done this many times. Um, I really love this particular business and the team I put together. Um, I hope I can leave this to them to take over um, when I move on, because the answer to your question is, I think this is my last hurrah. I've got about another, I've got three years into it. My goal is to have about another three years. I want to get to about 500 customers. And at that point, I'll be looking to exit, um, hopefully to the employees that are here, if not to some other company or resource that finds value in this and can take it to the next level that maybe I can't because I don't know what I don't know today. Uh, right now I'm growing this business organically. Um, and if it can uh, continue to move on this path, which I see no reason that it won't, um, you know, that's my goal is to, in three years from now, just play tennis and swim every day, um, which are things that I would like to do more of. Um, but uh, at the same time, I'm enjoying the ride. Um, you know, everybody does have to find, uh, Travis, the answer to the question. Uh, you know, what is that exit point or pivot point, um, you know, for you? For me, as I said, because I've done this before, um, I'm probably not going to look for something else. Again, that's for the benefit of my wife listening to this, if she does. Um, uh, but then again, I've said that before. So, so the, <laughs> the, the, real, the real honest answer to you is I don't know what will come three, four years from now once I leave this particular business. Um, but I would like to think that this is my last stop. Um, and, uh, and I just want to grow it to all it can be for my customers. I want to see people who are buying one printer today to buy a second and a third printer, which is because that's my business, is to see them grow, but to sell and support the machines to support that growth. Um, and then again, see the overall growth of this company to get to somewhere about 500 unique businesses that we've been able to create for people. Awesome. Well, Paul, thank you so much for your time here on the podcast and wish you all the best of luck. Thank you, Travis. I enjoyed talking with you. So my number one takeaway from my conversation with Paul was just really the importance of being able to identify the specific problem you're solving for people with your business and communicating clearly how your business is on the path to success for them. So if you can take a step back and, and not only identify what you do and how you do it and why you do it better than anyone else, but putting it in the terms that make sense for that particular person or company that you want to do business with so that they see you as being a part of a solution they really want in their lives. And so for Paul, it was you want to grow your revenue or you want to start a kind of business like this that leverages this technology. And here's how we partner with you to make that happen. So if you can start putting your business in those terms, when you're in those kind of sales uh, conversations with prospects and, and people that could become clients, that's really going to help you increase the percentage of those prospects that turn into clients. So 
Make sure that you check out uh, thewallprinter.com. You can see their social media platforms and all the things that they're doing if you want to reverse engineer some of the success that they have found. And be sure to subscribe to this podcast if this is your first time here and listening to it. We're here a couple times a month just dropping insights and strategies and sharing wisdom that can help you grow a company that you feel really great about. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for listening. And as always, be honest. (laughs) 